folks, welcome back. I'm just Shannon Levin, your friendly librarian, and I'm back for some book love, so let's chat. Um, got a lot going on as usual, and uh, Sunny, good morning from Ohio. It's beautiful here. Today is, <clears throat> let's see, Wednesday, July 17th, which is crazy. Um, and I have quite a few books that I've read since last time we've chatted. Um, that I want to talk to you about. And then I've got some book haul and I've got some, uh, a lot of review today. Uh, and when I say review, like things that I start talking about and then realize I haven't talked to you about them. Um, so quite a bit of that. I would say there's a little baby bunny coming up to the deck. I don't know what you think's up here. Well, maybe some bird seed. Do bunnies eat bird seed? The squirrels sure do. Um, but uh, I'm excited to talk to you today. I am right off of the trip um, to Columbus with my cousin Deb to the Columbus Book Festival. It was phenomenal. This is the second year that we've gone, the second year that they've had it. That would be my t-shirt. Last year we passed up the t-shirts. Price point was a little high. This time, ridiculously um, affordable and perfect. Uh, it has genres on it. So it says Columbus Book Festival, and then it's got like thrillers, romance, historical fiction, fantasy. Um, if you are new here, I teach high school English, mainly to freshmen, and we talk a lot about genres and trying to find books that they want to read. You'll hear the pitter-patter of Stella's Little Feet um, as she's flying around here today looking for the neighbor's dog, just waiting patiently for them to come out so she can go out and um, harass them. Um, I'm drinking tea today from my Elsie mug. I know my name is Deshanna, but my very first name is Elsie. I just don't normally go by that. So I've got that little Elsie, um, I think it's Borden, isn't it Borden? The Elsie, the milk cow. Um, and I'm just drinking tea because I am here filming this for the next couple of hours. Um, what time is it? Almost eight o'clock. I think about 11 o'clock is when I have to go meet my friends. Um, it is wonderful being a teacher in the summer because you get to be a ladies who lunch, uh, which is my life aspiration. I'm very good at it. Uh, so I'm going to meet some friends and we're going to go to a coffee house in Hillsboro, Ohio called Sassafras. I've been wanting to go there, super excited about that. Um, and I know that I will be drinking a coffee there. So little, little tea for me this morning, um, to at least get caffeinated enough to talk to you about all these wonderful books. So as usual, give me a minute to get the book set down and um, then we'll start on the ones that I've read since the last time I talked to you. And I looked back, my uh, book group is getting ready to meet. I'm hosting on August 1st, I think it's a Thursday, and this is our planning session, which means everybody brings their calendars, everybody brings their recommendations, and we set the meetings for the next year. And um, I was looking back to see what books I would be recommending and it's odd, I'll have to talk to you about it a little bit later, but it's odd, I, I don't have a ton of books that I've read this year that I wanna throw out to that group because I'm very big on trying to put the right book in the right person's hands. And every, every book club has a flavor, right? A personality. And I've not read a lot that I think my book club will like, but I've read some really, really good books. So I've been working on trying to um, get some suggestions, but my number one rule when you are recommending a book for book club is you must have read it and be a part of our book club and know whether or not the vast majority is gonna have something to say about it. Don't have to like it, um, doesn't have to be an easy book, definitely needs to have something to talk about. And um, I don't know, when I look back on my last year of reading, I've got some good books, but not a lot that would fit into my book club. They're very historical fiction and about the only historical fiction I read is for my book club. Um, but. I usually throw in a nonfiction one. That seems to be something that I feel like I can get out there to them. Um, and then I love mysteries. I love thrillers. I've been reading more modern fiction in the last five years or so. Um, so those are some that I usually have to get out there. So anyway, that was a side note. I'll be right back. All right, that's better. Um, it looks like the last time that I filmed was Thursday, June 13th. That's ridiculous. I know every summer I say I'm going to do more and then it gets crazy as it always does why is it it's i just i'm always amazed in the summer i'm like how in the world do i hold down a full-time job all through the year and get so much done and then in the summer get nothing done and i am not but quite frankly i don't stay home as much as i probably should 
Um, what did I say today was the 17th? I'm pretty sure it was the 17th. Yes. Wednesday, July 17th. So just in case you're watching this and you are concerned there's something that I say, um, you know, and you're wondering, well, I wonder when she filmed that. That's when I filmed it. So, uh, and then this is my stack of the books that I've read since the last time, um, we've chatted. So let me get a little, um, candle going. This one is amazing. I will definitely buy some more. Um, I got this in Little Nashville, Indiana. We always go, um, a group of girls go at the beginning of December for some Christmas shopping to kick off the season. This is Lake House Candles and it's Palo Santo, um, that particular scent. I like these little um, small candles. Um, I don't burn candles all the time in the house. If you've been with me, you know we had a soot issue one time and I'm scarred. Really don't think it had anything to do with candles, but I don't know, therefore, um, I don't, I don't burn them very often, but I do always like to burn them when I'm with you. So uh, there's that going, make it nice and cozy for us. In addition to the um, shirt for the weekend, my cousin Deb brought me some, uh, a little hosting gift. These little bookworm socks, ankle socks, which are adorable and these little uh, book erasers that look like little books and it says travel the world in a book and reading is cool those are adorable she also got me these um uh, lots of little stickers um and i put them on my new travel stanley it's not the it's not the newly popular like stan stanley uh, thermos it's the travel one uh, when we were traveling, I realized that I needed one with a little handle on the top, um, like that a car, is it called a carpenter, can go on that you can like strap it on there and that actually closes. Most of mine don't. I don't know, like most of my uh, Yetis and all of that are like for sipping and just taking on travel, but they're not good for something like this. So worked out when I got back. Um, my sister was like, hey, look at this. We're going to get these. Do you want one of these? Of course I do. Um, so just throwing those things out there because they're cute little bookish things. At the Columbus Book Festival, I carried my little bookish purse and I don't think I've shown this to you. My mom got it for me for my birthday a couple of years ago. It's a Mary Poppins. It looks like a book. Super cute. It has the, um, you know, what do you call that? Crossbody one. And then it also has the little anklet, um, wristlet there. It does have a back to it. I've never read Mary Poppins, so what I need to do is actually read the book, but it's got a couple of little things on the inside. I don't see a brand name for this. I know I've seen it though, especially in Lebanon at the, um, some of the little boutiques there. I know I've seen this, I don't, so I don't know what the brand is, but um, probably could find it that way. But that's what I carried and I did want to share it with you because again, it's bookish and I love it. Uh, my cousin said she did get all those little goodies from, um, the what's it called tiffany square plaza is the place in florida um maybe punta gorta i think that's right um it's called the bookworm it's um a bookstore that has lots of used books i think she also sells new books um oh and where's the little bookworm and there's a little bookworm i'll have to find them for you later but um i did also get a little bookworm that's gonna look super cute on my shelf but um, I do want to tell you, and she got me a couple of books that I'm sure I'll be showing in the book haul. Mary Oliver's Dog Songs is the one that I can recall um, for sure. And I think she got me an Agatha that I didn't have a copy of. Pretty sure that's the other one she got me. Uh, but anywho, super fun that she flies up here and we go to the Columbus Book Festival. And we are definitely doing that on an annual basis. Last year was good. This year was better. Um, if you are anywhere in the vicinity or like Deb, you're not, and you can get a cheap flight and have a friend you can stay with and travel with. Um, it was ridiculous, ridiculously good. But let's talk about those books uh, that I finished since the last time I talked to you first. I left off on the last video on my 48th book of the year, which was Robert Parker's um, rough, rough Weather, the one where the girl gets kidnapped from her own wedding. Um, love Robert Parker. That's where we left off the last time. So that takes us to number 49, Unhoneymooners, which I thought I had a copy of. Yeah. Um, Unhoneymooners by Christina Warren. And I actually had already, uh, or was reading this. Yeah, I had already read it. Sorry. 
when um, we went to a little coffee shop somewhere and they had the um, take and leave shelf and I always bring a little bag with me with a couple of books in it so that I can share and so I left a book and I picked up a copy of this one because I think that my daughter-in-law will love this book but it's the Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren um, it's funny it is modern um, let me see did I write down the genre there it's modern fiction, romantic fiction. Um, there's a little bit of spice in it, but really not very much. The other Christina Lauren book that I have read was Beautiful Bastard. Um, and I read this a long time ago, and I believe I did have, yeah, I already had a review out there for this. Um, it was recommended by multiple friends. It's just a fast, fun adult read. You can tell it's one of those. Now this one was much smuttier. Um, and I remember that I did really enjoy it. I haven't read anything else by her since then, but I did really enjoy this one. Um, whip smart, hardworking, and on her way to an MBA, Chloe Mills has only one problem, her boss, Bennett Ryan. He's exciting, blunt, inconsiderate, and completely irresistible. Bennett has returned to Chicago from France to take a vital role in his family's massive media business. High-powered, handsome man, full of himself. Never expected that the assistant who'd been helping him from abroad was gorgeous, innocent, provocative, completely infuriating creature. He now has to see every day, hate to love trope, a lot of spice. This one's very high on the spice factor, but Unhoneymooners was not. And again, I think you can see it's following a trend. These were very popular and these are still very popular, but these have been, be been becoming more popular. And um, I think that Christina Lauren just followed along. Um, Olivia Torres, so you do have um, some nice cultural references in there with Olivia. And her sister is getting married at the wedding. Um, some uh, unfortunate circumstances take place. And she ends up having to take the honeymoon that her sister was supposed to be taking because it's a no money back guarantee and her sister can't take it. She ends up, once again, love to hate trope. She ends up with the groom's brother um, who takes his part on the honeymoon. And um, they do have to pretend to be their siblings in order to fulfill the requirements to take the trip. But they love the trip. It's in, where is it at? Maui, uh, which again, my Hawaii thing. I did since the last time I talked. I think I was already back from Hawaii when I talked to you. I'm pretty sure. I think I had just come back. Pretty sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, but um, I read a lot of fiction. I'm very thematic. I'm very seasonal in my reading. So I was trying to read anything that was set in Hawaii um, or had to do with Hawaii when I was there. So this was perfect. I listened to the audio. I'm pretty sure the whole time I listened to the audio and I loved it. Sorry about that. It's actually a text from a former student we've been reading. Rich dad, poor dad. We've been listening to it on audio and then talking about it. And I sent him a message quickly this morning and said, hey, pretty sure I'm going to finish it today. It's long, like, uh, you know, maybe 14 hours or something. So we've been working on it for a couple of months. There's another little rabbit. What's going on? Now that I'm sitting here and seeing, <coughs> I wonder if the little family's living under my porch. So modern chiclet, romance, humor, definitely humor. I really enjoyed this one. It was an enjoyable read. If you're looking for a beach read, this would be a good one. Oh, I did make a note. So I was listening to this when I was preparing for my son's wedding, uh, which is funny because this is the unhoneymoon. Un but the wedding goes off well. It's the reception that things start happening. So there was that. It was easy to dip in and out of while I was just, you know, cleaning and preparing, crafting, packing. It had some funny parts. It has some very touching parts. Um, I really liked the um, unexpected way that she describes her characters. I could be friends with these people. I love to read books that I think I could be friends with these people. Family dynamics are really what makes um, so much of this book. It's the relationship that she has with her sister and he has with his brother and she has with her family. There are two narrators on the audio, one male and one female, and it made it feel more like a performance. So if you're into those kinds of audios, 
I know some people struggle with audios and I think that might be the key is finding one that's more like this where it's more of a performance where you feel like you're watching TV without having to watch the screen. Um, so that might be another way to do that. So that was my 49th book of the year. Um, Christina Lawrence, The Unhoneymooners, highly recommend. Probably gave it four out of five. I don't know why I don't write these things down, but probably gave it four out of five. Um, the next book that I read was Toward Zero. Um, it's one of my Agatha Christie ones. If you've been with me before, you would know that in 2022, um, I started a group and we are reading Agatha Christie in chronological order. And so this um, was the one that, that we read. It was my 50th book of the year, got over that hump. My goal for the year is 102 because last year was 101 and I met it. Um, and I'm well on my way. I don't think I'm gonna have any problem doing that as long as I keep up my regular pace, which is why I set a goal to start with. Not so that I can just check off a box, but it keeps me motivated knowing that I'm doing less scrolling or less mindless television. I love television, I love mindless scrolling, but there should be a balance. And I know I should be able to get to 102 books if I'm balancing those things out. So Toward Zero, it's a superintendent battle book, superintendent number five. Um, I don't know why I don't have it here, but um, we're somewhere around the, the late 30s, I think. Oh, let me look it up here for a sec. Number 43 in chronological order and the number five superintendent battle and actually the last superintendent battle, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is more of one of those maybe 80s covers as opposed to some of my favorite really vintage covers. Uh, it does have a map in there. And uh, this was a fun one. I really liked this one. 1972, I think is this one. And you can tell it's not quite as vintagey as the other ones. I definitely moved this one up on my ranking list. Um, I am not good at all at ranking the Agathas. It's like whatever the latest one is, is probably my favorite. I was into it up until the very end reveal. Like I, the whole time, I'm just in it and I don't know who did it and I suspect everyone and I don't, I just can't put my finger on who it is or why they might've done it. And it took me all the way to the end. And that's the kicker with Agatha. She's really good at that. And I just, I didn't know that before I started reading multiple books by her. Um, I don't know how many authors that you read like their whole, their whole au revoir, um, but I don't do a whole lot of that because I seem to tire of authors. And I have yet to get tired of Christy. And what did I say? This is number 43. The, I mean, that's crazy. I've read 43 plus, because we read a couple out of order like A Christmas and when the movies came out for Death on the Nile and uh, another one, I, Halloween Party, we read those out of order. But um, I just, I didn't realize that there wasn't a murder being talked about until the murder finally happened. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, that was a long time to get to a murder and a murder mystery. The characters are super perplexing. They're not flat. The mystery is one of those that is like, how could this happen? And the setting on this one is definitely a character in the whole book. Uh, the one thing about superintendent and this one, because we, you know, have read four books where there's superintendent and he's a pretty light character. Like he's no Perot, he's no Miss Marple, um, but he's an interesting character. But in this one, we get to see him interact with his family. There's some family issues going on um, at the very beginning that then twine into the story in a very Agatha way. Highly recommend this one. You could read this one. You can read them out of order, um, but sometimes when there's... Um, a particular one that lies heavy on you knowing Perot or you knowing something or how it relates. This one does not. You can just read it at any time. Toward Zero, I love the size of the Agathas. They're super easy. I usually read the book and listen to the audio and watch a movie if there's a movie. And pretty sure I did all of those on this one. This is a good example of, I always like to know where the title is coming from, where it says Toward Zero. And there's a quote pretty early in the book. Um, where the uh, character says zero hour. Yes, all of them were converging towards zero. So his point is a mystery starts way before the murder ever happens and then makes its way toward that point zero where the murder actually happens. And then I also like where he says, if I were writing one of these amusing stories of blood and crime, I should begin now with an elderly gentleman sitting in front of the fire, opening his letters, going unbeknownst to himself towards zero. And then that's exactly what happens. It's so good. I highly recommend it. That was my number 50. My number 51 
was Brandy and Bullets. I'm also making my way in this one. I'm just doing on my own. But Murder, She Wrote, I love the series. I've watched it, like, just growing up, watched it all the time. And then um, pre-pandemic, so, you know, a while back, I started watching them in um, order, like on Netflix or Amazon Prime. I can't remember whatever it was. And then while I was doing that, then they announced they were going to take it off on like January 1st or whatever. So then I was in a mad dash to finish watching them in order. And um, so somewhere along the line, like I picked up one of the um, books based off of the series. So this is not a series based, based off of a book, um, a TV series based off of a book series. This is a book series based off of a TV series. But they're very true to form. Like they feel very Murder, She Wrote. So I've been enjoying that. So I read Brandy and Bullets. Um, they do say by Jessica Fletcher, which is ridiculous because she's not a real person. And then it says, and David Bain. So we're gonna say it's David Bain. Based on the Universal Television series created by Peter S. Fisher, Roger Levison, and William Link. Now, the thing about these books is they do sometimes line up with a particular episode. Um, I don't know that this one does. It, you can see it has the um, snow on the trees. So if I'm going to read them in order, I'm not always going to be seasonal and I'm okay about that. And go ahead and judge me for giving a Murder, She Wrote Cozy Mystery a four. But I felt like I was watching the show the whole time, which is exactly the feeling that I'm, I'm into. And um, I just really, really enjoy reading them. Now, I like them in print. I usually listen to my cozies. That's my preference. I usually like listening to my cozies. I do it while I'm cleaning and crafting and working, whatever. Um, but uh, for this one, I had a copy of it, so I read it that way, and I super enjoyed it, and I literally feel like I'm watching the movie when I'm reading it. It's super enjoyable to me. Um, this is my fourth one. It took me a long time to track this one down. Uh, sometimes they're easy. Sometimes they're all over. Like, I picked up four or five of them. I think that we're, might, might be in a book haul here somewhere. Um, not too long ago at a half price books and then I'll go forever and not find any. So these are books that I don't often find thrifting. I usually have to buy them at um, half price books, which is fine. That's fine. Even half price books, especially if you're talking a um, paperback, it's going to be four or five dollars. That's not usually a big deal. They do some of them come in hardback. You can see right here I have Murder, She Wrote, Coffee, Tea, or Murder. And up there is Murder, She Wrote, Murder on Parade. And that one's a hardback one. Um, so I'm starting to acquire those as I'm starting to acquire my Christie's, but I really enjoyed this one. Jessica is in Cabot Cove for this mystery and includes, it includes a lot of the Cabot Cove people. Cabot Cove is in Maine, by the way. Um, this one has a writer's residence that they're building, um, out of, a, a building that, or a structure that is already in Cabot Cove. Um, not all the townspeople are happy about having an artist's residence structure there. They think those people are a lot like hokey and they're going to bring a lot of problems. Um, they don't necessarily bring a lot of problems because they're writers, but you know, Jessica's there. Jessica lives in Cabot Cove. You probably need to kick her out of town if you don't want these things happening because that is what's going to happen. I was watching, just in case you're wondering, Roku has a Murder, She Wrote channel um, you know, how, like when, I don't know how yours is, but my smart TV, when you turn it on, it's a Roku television. It comes up to that main screen and it always has something that it's suggesting. And it always seems to be suggesting Murder, She Wrote, that it's streaming live now. Now, I clicked on it a couple of times and just had it on there when I was, you know, pittering around the house or whatever. Um, but this time I was like, this is really weird. Like, it's always on. Yes, it's always on because Roku, on the Roku actual platform has a Murder, She Wrote um, channel that just continuously runs the Murder, She Wrotes in order. So if you're interested, it's there. And um, the other day I had a lot to do with the house. I was unpacking and cleaning and um, just getting a lot of stuff done. And um, so I just left it on the channel all day long. And I told my husband, I'm like, you would have appreciated this because he says it all the time. Um, Jessica had to take the stand and they were trying to tell, they were trying to discredit her. And the way they tried to discredit her is they started talking about all of the relatives and friends that she has that, that have either been accused of murder or have murdered. <laughs> and she was like, but, but, but that doesn't make any sense. These people were, they, they were innocent. They were in, and they were like, Hmm, okay, right. But you just happen to know all these people who've been, you know, accused of murder. So it was super funny. 
Um, so there's that one. That was my number 51. That one is Brandy and Bullets. So I think my next one um, I picked up in, a, in the haul. So I think I'll be talking to you about that here in a little bit. My number 52 is I return to a Penny Reed. I've talked to you about Penny Reed before. Um, I probably need to do a bit of a deep dive on her with you um, because I have a lot of reviews out there, but I think I might be missing some. But do I have her in here? I don't think so. I think I have them over there because I'm working on it. So I'm going to work on it and come back to that. But I've read Penny Reed in the past and I love her Knitting in the City series. This one is Knitting in the City number five, Happily Ever Ninja. Um, not too long ago, I talked to you about the one that falls right before this, which was Ninja Ever After, maybe, or something like that, which was the um, story of this couple getting together. This one jumps ahead. They now have two kids. Um, and they're in the midst of working, they're working lives before I think they're in college when we, when we meet them. I feel like that one's just like a small one though, like a novella and not a whole, um, book where this one is, but it's, this isn't my favorite read. Like I love getting back to her and I love the last one. This one was a little harder to read. Um, it's still a four star cause it still has the plot development, the character development. It's still funny. It's, it's a little steamy, which I like. Um, but at the same time, it gets a little more serious than I want it to be and people are in danger. Does that make sense? I don't know that there are any other Penny Reads where people are in danger. So I was worried. I was worried for them. Um, I've read Reed's other series. The Knitting in the City is this one. Then Winston Brothers, Hypothesis, Ele Elements of Chemistry, Rugby. This one's just serious and a little more dark. And it wasn't what I was thinking when I wanted a Penny Read. I do love her unique mixture of heat and drama and a backstory and complicated characters and humor. She does a great job of that. I recommend her all the time. I recommended them to her to my daughter-in-law and then she's read more than I have at this point. I will definitely be continuing this series. I think I have Homecoming King on my Kindle, so I want to read that around Homecoming. But this particular one is about Fiona and her husband. Um, Fiona, uh, that he calls her the ninja mother, wife, and friend. Uh, but she also just happens to be an ex-CIA agent, and that comes in necessary when her husband is kidnapped. Uh, the next one that I read was on my Kindle, I think. And I don't know why it was on there, but I clicked on it one day, started reading, and then just continued reading it. It's Death by Bagpipes. This is my number 53 for this year. A Summer Murder in Edinburgh. So if you like your cozy mystery set in a cozy setting, Edinburgh will do it for you. Um, this is in a series called Travel Can Be Murder. It's number four in the series, and I've not read the ones that come before it, and I didn't really need to. Like, I know there is definitely a um, backstory to it, but I'm okay not knowing it. I didn't need to have to know all of that. It did get a little bit heavy on the details and drama instead of like true sustenance for me. So I like my cozies to have a little more sustenance, which is crazy, I know. But at the same time, there's like, it's got to be a good balance. So this one was probably a three out of five for me. I haven't read any of the others in the series or by this author, but I would be willing to read or listen to another one. Like, it's not like I didn't like it. I just didn't love it. I do like the premise that the main character is a travel agent. I thought that was very fresh. The next one I read was because I was going to Hawaii um, and I saw that Michael Crichton, who I love, the Jurassic Park Michael Crichton, um, when he died, he had the bones for a book that he wanted to write called Eruption about a volcano erupting on Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, mm, yeah, I probably shouldn't be reading this, but I'm going to anyway. Um, James Patterson picked it up and ran with it. And he supposedly did actually do it. You know how James Patterson is famous for putting his name on books that he hasn't written because he just writes them alongside someone else. This one, his, the Michael Crichton's family entrusted James Patterson to do this. So I think he really did. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, in 1994, I read The Andromeda Strain, Rising Sun in the Lost World. And then I loved them so much, I went back and read Jurassic pa uh, Park. Highly recommend Jurassic Park and Lost World and Andromeda and Rising Sun. I love them all. Eruption lost a little bit for me, but it was still really good. But I'm not sure I'm going to remember it like I remember his other thrillers. Um, Michael Crichton's also known th for throwing science in there. And this is kind of science heavy, but in a good way, I was always interested. 
I love all of Michael Crichton's movie adaptations as well. Uh, while we were in Hawaii, they pointed out places that Jurassic Park was filmed. Um, you couldn't get very close unless you paid to take those tours, but we did see the general area and I could totally see how they could have filmed Jurassic Park in Hawaii. We went to um, Oahu, um, so that's the island that we were on. I think that a lot of Jurassic Park was also filmed on one of the other islands, but it was definitely some of it was filmed on Oahu and I enjoyed that. So I enjoyed listening. I listened to this mainly when we were in Hawaii, on the way there, on the balcony, in the bedroom. Uh, just, I listened to it a lot and I, on the beach, I really enjoyed it. It's um, a very suspenseful listen. You're worried about people, actually a lot of people, because it might affect the whole world, not just this one island in Hawaii when it um, erupts and that was entertaining. Um, and just when you think that all hope is lost, of course, someone comes in and saves the world. I like that trope. If you do too, you would like um, Michael Crichton and James Patterson's eruption number 54 of the year for me. Uh, while we were in Hawaii, they had a um, little bookshelf down in the lobby, and I will love them for it forever, a leave one, take one kind of shelf, and someone had left the Lonely Planet, Honolulu, Waikiki, and Oahu um, guide. I read the whole guide. I used it. I carried it with me all week. There was a pull-out map that I ended up having to bring because I marked it all up, but I put the book back on the shelf when I left. Loved it. Highly recommend The Lonely Planet. I know I've watched some of their videos too, but it was really helpful and it gave a lot of little tips and tricks of when you were in um, Honolulu, Waikiki, and Oahu. I loved it. There were a couple of other little book exchange places that I ran into, like especially the Hilton um, down closer to the beach and they were awful book exchanges. So it was nice that every day I would pop over there and see what got put on the shelf. I didn't end up bringing home any of those and I, I did leave. That's right. I was like, did I leave something? I left, um, I left a book that I brought to trade. Um, I left a book on the shelf. Um, we had heard, like I watched all the videos prior to going to Hawaii, um, food and travel and what you should see. I listened to, I watched all of those. I really, really enjoyed doing that as I was preparing for that trip. And a lot of videos were talking about a resort tax. Um, that you would get upon arrival. So just be prepared for that because it could be hundreds of dollars. And um, I asked John's aunt, the one who helped us find the timeshare <coughs> and uh, schedule the air flights and uh, just all kinds of stuff. We would never have made it there without her pushing us and helping us do that. Um, but I mentioned this to her and she's like, no, in all of our years of having a timeshare, we've never had that happen. I'm like, all right. But I told John, I'm like, hey, all of the videos are saying this, so you just need to be prepared. And they actually talked about it in this guide. It's a new thing. So if you are planning a trip, I'm sure it's not just Hawaii, but if you are planning a trip, I do think this is a post pandemic thing. Um, just know that in addition to this great deal that you think you're getting on a resort location, like resort, um, hotel, that sort of thing, we even asked, we asked beforehand, we called and we asked, um, but because we were using someone's timeshare, like extra getaway or something like that, we weren't using their main week. <coughs> <clears throat> the resort wouldn't even talk to us because we hadn't booked through them. They're like, talk to your travel, your travel person, which we did and they didn't say anything. Um, but if you can nail down whether or not you're going to have that resort fee, it's just not, it was hundreds of dollars. Um, of course, it wasn't the same as how much we paid for the hotel, but it was quite a bit. Um, so uh, if you can figure out if you're going to get charged that, you want to figure that into whether or not you think you're getting a good deal. We've still got a good deal, but I will search out more Lonely Planet guidebooks. That was my 55th book. Um, I listened to this one while we were there too. It was number 56. Aloha Alibi by Jasmine Webb. I would say that this is on the cozy adjacent. Um, so it's cozy, but uh, it was my first web cozy and uh, it's very funny, but it, you know, like plays around a little bit with language or situations that might make it a little more cozy adjacent. There are lots of references that I love, like my favorite murder. I was looking for some Hawaii-based reads, so this was a great Hawaii, uh, Hawaiian cozy. It was a pretty quick listen. 
I'll definitely continue the series. And I do have to say, I know that um, cozies are popular for a reason and it's the tropes a lot of times that we're after. Uh, girl moves back home after a failed relationship, gets a job at an ice cream shop, as if you can make money and live off of that. Um, solves a murder. I don't care if it's tropey. I still really, really liked it. Um, my number 57 was a chunker. <laughs> I mean, whoo, goodness. James Mishner's Hawaii. My book club had recommended this years ago, and I didn't really have a reason, um, a motivation to read it. What's here? Okay. Um, but then when I knew I was going, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to like find the book and I'm like, that should keep me busy. Oh, it did. I did not get to finish this while we were there, but I read it. I listened to it. Um, it's a lot. It's very heavy, but I highly recommend it, especially if you're going to Hawaii. It is the history and it's the history through people. And I mean, from the beginning of time history. Um, so it is very heavy. Uh, but heavy in a good way. Like, I appreciated the stories. They're going to stick with me. You get a lot of culture. Hawaii is all about culture, so it makes sense. I highly recommend it if you are super interested in Hawaii and Hawaiian culture or if you're going there. But just know it's not a quick or an easy listen or read. Like, I had to leave this and go to Al Aloha Alibi for a while quite a few times because it really made me think. Religion runs through this. Um, spirituality runs through this, which are two things that are very deep in the Hawaiian culture. Um, and just the characterization was ridiculously good. And you're following the lineages through the beginning of time. Like it's not over a couple of decades. It's from the beginning of time. It's how Hawaii was formed as an island, um, not as just a society. Ridiculously good, but very heavy. Um, and I'm sure I gave that a five out of five because it was just, it was phenomenal. The next book I read, oh, uh, number 58 was The Drifter by Nicholas Petrie. Um, I actually have a copy of this. I'll try and see where it is. I mean, it's not my copy. My cousin Deb brought it to um, exchange while she was here. She finished it. Um, so she was just going to exchange it. And then we ended up not visiting any exchange, like free little libraries anywhere. Um, on the trip to Dayton. Uh, so I have that and I will put it into a um, little free library for her on her behalf um, uh, soon. But Nick Petrie, we decided to read because he was at the Columbus uh, Book Festival and we were able to secure tickets for his talk, his breakout session. It's definitely our favorite thing about going to the Columbus Book Festival are the breakout sessions where you hear from an author. We had never heard of Nick Petrie prior to going to this festival and I'm telling you, it was just, this is why it's so, it's so good. We um, read the book. I super enjoyed it. I already knew I was going to continue reading the series. He's very Robert Parker-ish, um, which I like. And I had just finished Robert Parker. And so it lined up with that. Um, but he was such a good speaker. Um, and I was telling my husband, he was like, I don't get it. Like, what's he talk about? Because I was like, he was so, so good. He's like, what does he talk about? He talked about his family. He talked about how he... Uh, the writing process, getting published. He talked about the motivation for his characters, how he set up his characters, um, the the issues that are in his books. I don't know what he talked about, but he talked for an hour and it was phenomenal. <laughs> so um, just highly, highly, highly recommend Nick Petrie. I did. He, I have a book in the book hall. Um, on the way back when I stopped at a Goodwill, there was a, or no, Half Price Books, I think it was there, and I picked up a book by him. I think that's where it was. Um but I borrowed the audio from Libby uh, for The Drifter. It's the first one in the Peter Ash series. Peter Ash is your main character. He is a vet. He's a vet that's come back home and has um, a lot of PTSD, but in a way that I wasn't expecting. Um, I just, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't think about some of these issues. Like it took me a long time to realize why the heck won't this guy go inside and take a shower? Oh, now I get it. Uh, and he does such a good job of doing that. I think my biggest surprise when we started listening to Nick Petrie speak is that he is not a vet because he was able to voice it in such a unique way um, and deal with it in um, a very convincing way that I just, I assumed he was a vet. I have to go change out my computer. This one apparently is dead. 
Oh, it looks like I did not mention, Christina Lauren is actually the combined pen name of longtime writing partners and best friends, Christina Hobbs and Lauren Billings. And I don't think that I knew that prior to looking up some information about Christina Lauren and the books that she did. So I thought that was super cute. And also the Unhoneymooners is part of the series. It's the first one. The second one's called The Honeymoon Crashers. So I will totally be listening to that. Like I loved it couple of things so my computer died and then I get the next one then I like actually look at my notes um I had shown you this book that uh, a student of mine last year she and her mother gave me Agatha Christie's Detectives five novels and um Toward Zero is all is also in this one so this one has The Murder at the Vicarage, Dead Man's Folly, Sad Cypress, Toward Zero, and NRM um, so I just love that it also has that in there and I wanted to show you that and I had forgotten and then whenever I was up getting the computer I went ahead and got my little bookworm who is absolutely adorable he will look great on my shelf um, you know just got to get him moving in the right direction here there we go uh, he will look great on my shelf my cousin Deb gave me him and then she left the drifter here so I will throw that in a free little library there we go. Um, but we're still talking a little bit about the drifter. I just happened to notice that I should have mentioned a couple of things there. Uh, there is some strong language in the drifter. So it is that kind of book. When I say Robert Parker, Robert Parker's probably a little less on the language, but there is some, there's definitely innuendos. There's a lot of off screen, um, love going on in Robert Parker. Um, and not so much of that so far in the drifter, but we may be getting into that. Like I said, I've only, this is only the first one in the Peter Ash series. And, um, there's a little bit of, uh, mention there of when he's thinking about women. Um, and it just, it, it flows. Like I wouldn't even have thought to mention the language had I not have jotted it down, but I jotted it down to make sure that you do know there's some language in there. It's not distracting at all. It's very authentic. They're veterans, they're going through trauma. Um, it's just, it's really good. This is a definitely, uh, this is definitely a character driven novel if you're still wondering what that means. It's all based on this main character. I do feel like I learned a lot through this book about veterans and PTSD. His triggers just made so much more sense when I realized what was going on. And the dog. The dog's a whole story. The dog's a whole story. He comes in at the beginning. I love him already. Um, the way he then interacts with people and the, the fact that he is doing his job. I love the dog. It's very fast paced, kept my interest the whole time. Um, I have another Agatha since the last time I talked to you, Death Comes at the End. We try and meet every three weeks or so, but it doesn't always happen that way depending on vacations or holidays and just people. Um, but we read Death Comes as, as the End, and I love this one. I don't know. This is the kicker. We are number, what number of Christy? Number 44. Um, it's not a Perot. It's not a Miss Marple. Um, it's set in ancient Egypt. I didn't even know this existed. Like, this is why I love Agatha. Every time you turn around, she just never fails to surprise me. Ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt. And you were, again, probably halfway through the book before a murder takes place. Um, and they're not sure it's even a murder. Of course it is because you're reading Agatha. Super unique, probably the most unique Agatha to date. Um, I don't know. She writes this as if this is how she always writes. It's crazy how easily she steps into this historical fiction for her. I had a lot of or I had a lot of suspicions and superstitions, but suspicions, but um, I just was wrong on every front. And when I say superstitions, it is ancient Egypt and they are afraid they are being stalked by someone's unhappy spirit. <clears throat> but as usual, Christy does not give in to that. <laughs> I was just, till the very, very end, so interested in what was going on here. I know I'm constantly like looking out my window, but it's because it's ridiculous out there birds and squirrels and bunnies and just things passing by that I'm like, what is that? What is that? Catches my eye. A really funny little tidbit. Stella's a terrible guard dog. Terrible. 
Um, we make fun of her all the time that we know someone's here before she does. Even if they like walk into the house and we know they're coming, she'll just be like, they're there, right? Yesterday, she went ballistic. We were on the porch. I was reading. She went ballistic. I'm like, what is going on? Now, she always goes ballistic when the um, neighbor's dogs are out because she loves to go and play with them and harass them. But this was a different kind of like growling. And so I immediately got up because, you know, we have a fence around the yard, but who knows? Um, and I looked over and there was this massive dog and he was walking by himself down the side lane. And when um, Stella started barking, um, he panicked and I think he ran home. So <laughs> I was like, good job. She never does that. Anywho, 59, death comes as the end. Um, I loved it the whole time. I highly recommend it. If it's the only Agatha that you read, you're going to be um, weirded out. This is not her usual, but it's definitely one of her best so far. Moved it to the top of my list. Number 60, Death by Spice Chai, I think is the last one I'm talking to you about. It's by Alex Erickson. I've talked to you about him before. Um, why does this not have a number on there? I'm pretty sure it's number 10. I don't know why Goodreads doesn't have it listed, but it's number 10 in um, the series. It also doesn't have the series name on here. How weird is that? But I started reading these back when I met um, Alex uh, Erickson at the Since I Bank Book by the Banks years ago. I knew he was going to be in Columbus. He'll also be back at Books by the Banks. So I just wanted to, you know, continue with that series. I love the series, so I'm happy to do it. I listened to this one on audio. Um, and I just, I enjoy the taking, it takes place in a book slash coffee shop. Um, pretty sure in Ohio, now that I'm saying that, I don't know why I don't have it on here, but I'm pretty sure it's set in Ohio. Um, the owner of the book slash coffee shop's dad is a famous author. And um, this is the death by coffee, death by tea, death by pumpkin spice. This is death by spiced chai. So highly recommend any of Alex Erickson's. They're very cozy mysteries. Um, I enjoy the characters. I enjoy the setting. I enjoy the, the people that I know always coming back into the story. Super easy to read. I didn't read any Duffy Browns. You know, I'm trying to read Duffy Brown for um, an event this fall. I didn't read any Tanya Kappas um, since the last time I talked to you. Uh, and you know, she again is at that thing in the fall that I'm trying to read, but I just haven't done that. Um, here are my notes on Penny Reed and her series. It is a bit complicated, like it's complicated. I printed out um, online her um, au revoir. And then they don't put it in order of the series. So I then had to make my own notes and then say, like, I read it on Kindle or I listened to this one. All right. You know, I've never had a copy, uh, like a copy of a Penny Read. I do some e-reading of hers, but um, it's a little bit complicated. It looks like I started back in maybe um, 2017 and then I just read here and there. But so far, the Knitting in the, Knitting in the City, Winston Brothers, um, and the rugby series are the three that I've mainly focused on. And I will return to those and just continuously be reading Penny Reed. Now, I also have some um, uh, publications that I wanted to point out to you. Um, I know that I talked to you about them whenever I was doing my book haul. I think a lot of these are the ones that my husband's cousin's wife, Emily, gave me. But I finished them. So I have Fairy. I have Good Grit. I have The Simple Things. I have What Women Create, um, and then I think I just picked this up somewhere. It's Edible, Ohio Valley, and then we have our Legend of Lorelei, which is the community that we live in. They put out a little newsletter. So those publications I have uh, been reading since the last time I talked to you, too, and I wanted to mention them. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if there's a word for these magazines that are like this, that are like, you know, $15 for a magazine, but this fairy was really good. Um, I enjoyed it. It's creating a creative life. Um, Good Grit was very fun and has one of our favorite guys there on the front, Leslie Jordan, who passed away after COVID, but I really got to love him during COVID. Um, the Simple Things has um, really interesting uh, articles. They're, it's eye candy. All of these are just eye candy, very cozy. Um, I pass them on to my cousin when I'm finished with them. What Women Create. Deb, I'll be sending you a picture to see which ones of these you want me to put in your media mail that I need to be mailing out today. And then that um, Edible Ohio Valley. I, uh, I read these anytime I can get my hands on them. 
which is not very frequent because they are like $15 a copy. But what I love is having people in my life that know me and will pass them on to me knowing that I will then pass them on to someone else when I'm finished. I love that. Bookstore Cafe Mystery Series is the Alex Erickson series. All right, that takes me to some revisits. So I'm gonna move some things around and I'll be back there. I'll be back with you in just a second. All right, when I was looking for the books on Hawaii or set in Hawaii, um, Sarah Val's name came up and it's one of those times like I have all of the books here. So these are books um, that I've talked to you about on YouTube, like this whole thing and this whole thing. These are my YouTube shelves um, and they're divided by sections like my Cozies, my Agathas, um, the Book of the Month um award-winning books like i plan to do um like a shelf tour for you i need to do that this summer maybe that'll be the next one i know you guys are like you are such a liar i do try really hard and then i get busy and don't do it but let me work on that one next as just a bookshelf tour or book tour probably should be what i am what i should do but then this continues so there's also this whole thing right here um, of a lot of books that i haven't talked to you about there are some um, at the top, there's some nonfiction I think that I've talked to you about, but not a lot. And then there's a lower shelf. It's like a half shelf here that has some books on it. And then in like my front entryway, when my um, son graduated from high school, we put a ladder and then my husband made shelves and then we used that for a display. And I loved it so much. It's very unfinished, but I absolutely love it. Um, and that's where my nonfiction books that I have not read, that's where they reside. So when I saw Sarah Val's name come up, I'm like, I really feel like I've thrifted um, a book of hers. And I had, it's Unfamiliar Fishes, um, and Sarah Val, she's an NPR gal, if, if that name rings a bell for you. And it, it, it has some stuff in there that I should have read about Hawaii. So this is on my very short to be read list. Many think of 1776 as the most defining year of American history. The year we became a nation devoted to the pursuit of happiness through self-government. In Unfamiliar Fishes, Sarah Val argues that in 1898 might be a year just as crucial in our nation's identity when an orgy of imperialism, the United States annexed Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Guam, and invaded Cuba, then the Philippines becoming a meddling, self-serving, militaristic international superpower practically overnight. Of all the countries the United States invaded or colonized in 1898, Val considers the story of the Americanization of Hawaii to be the most intriguing. And then she goes on to talk about it. So this was already on my shelf. I had thrifted it some time ago. So that's on my very short to be read list. And then of course, when I was looking for that, I saw a couple more that I've been talking to you about here recently. And I don't think I've actually shown you. And that would be Eric Schlosser's Reefer Madness. This is on a to be read list. <coughs> I talked to you about him um, recently because of the, um, Fast Food Nation. Let me see if that's right. Yeah, so I talked to you about Fast Food Nation, the fact that I listened to an NPR segment with him, um, Fresh Air, Our Fragile Food System, and then he talks about Michael Pollan, so that, you know, when it snowballed into Michael Pollan, um, who did the food, uh, INC. Uh, so there's that one, and there's supposed to be another one of those coming up. Um, and so Reefer Madness is on my 2BR because I have not read that yet, but I really like Eric Schlosser. And then I've talked to you about Michael Pollan and when I was looking through those, I also have a couple of 2BRs there. A Place of My Own, The Education of an Amateur Builder. Um, I love Michael Pollan. I've talked to you about him, but I have not shown you this and I need to move it in here to the short list. I talked to you about Pollen's um, Omnivore's Dilemma. Um, Cooked is on my to be read list. Um, and Food Rules. He's done one called Food Rules. I've talked to you about all of those, but I just, I hadn't shown you that that's on my to be read list. And then I've talked about Michael Perry, and I saw that I had some books in there of his that I haven't shown you. Off Main Street, Barnstormer's Prophets, and Gate Mouse Gator. Um, he is also the um, author of Population 485, which I have not read, but I've talked to you about Michael Pollan's truck, which I absolutely love and have reviewed. Um, so these are just, these are books that I need to continue reading by authors that I love. And then I have recently talked to you about Eric Larson for Devil in the White City, and I have this Isaac Storm, A Man of Time and the Deadliest Hurricane in History. So 
Um, my cousin Deb lives in Florida and we often talk about hurricanes, so it'd probably be kind of educational for me to read that one too. Um, I also have Larson's The Splendid and the Vile on my To Be Read list, but I love Devil in the White, White City. Love it, love it, love it. So I told you that I need to be reading uh, more Duffy Brown and Tanya Kappas. I can't say her name. Um, I have Killer and Krenlins. That's my next one in a consignment shop mystery. So that's on my very short to be read list. And then the Tanya Kappas, probably the next one that I'm going to read is called Fixin' to Die. It's a Kenny Lowry mystery. I'm trying to read at least the first one in each of their series. I've already read the first one in each of the Duffy Brown series, but Tanya Kappas has like 20 of them. So I am following her and I'm trying. I'm trying very hard to read at least the first one in each one of her series. I've already read the campers and campers and something crim, criminals, and I have already read um, the uh, holiday ones. I love those; those have been super fun. And oh, and also the Tanya uh, Cappy's a killer coffee mystery. I've read the first one in that, so I've got three of her series reading the first ones down, and then the next one is the Kenny Lowry. So I'm working on it. All right, give me a minute to switch around. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm going to do the Crichtons first. Um, so I talked to you about Michael Crichton's eruption. I have uh, reviewed a lot of Michael Crichton's books. I think I'm caught up, but I also have some to be read. So I just wanted to run through those real quick. So I told you I had read Rising Sun. I reviewed that back in 2020. Um, and I'm pretty sure I had read it prior to that. Um, it's his eighth novel. I absolutely loved it. It um, is political mystery thriller. Um, a, a dead body shows up at a very political heavy like convention in a hotel and people try and like, you know, push it under the rug. Um, Sean Connery stars in the movie version of this, but the book includes investigative transcripts, records, video interrogation transcripts, novelization. It, sh it just opens up so many issues and this is why I love Michael Crichton. Um, it is very fast paced. I absolutely loved it. I read it back in September of 1994. That's what I thought. But I have talked to you about that one before. Jurassic Park, I've talked to you numerous times. Um, I just absolutely love it. Andromeda Strain is super good. Very science based, especially after reading or after going through the pandemic. This would be a really good read. I loved it. The Lost World. Yeah, there we go. I'm like, there's no way I don't have a um, one in here for this. But I've talked to you about The Lost World before. Super easy to talk about. And then these I need to read. The Great Train Robbery, Congo, which I planned to read in Hawaii and I just didn't get to it. Case of Need, Timeline, Pirate Latitudes, and Micro. So I just wanted to throw those out in case when I'm talking about Michael Crichton, you're like, I feel like I've heard that name, but I'm not quite sure. This is why, because he's phenomenal. So... Um, I will read anything by him. They're super, super good. All right, now I'm going to clean it off and move to the next one. All right, so another little quick update. Remember, I have that class starting in the fall. First time I've taught this. When I say remember, I assume we're friends and that you follow me on, and you have watched all these and kept up with all of my news. But um, I'm teaching a new class in the fall. It's young adult literature. So I chose four authors to highlight. Um, and we are literally just reading those books and talking about them. So I'm super excited-ish, um, hoping that I get readers in there that realize that's what we're doing and that they're serious about reading these books and that they enjoy talking about books. So, um, you know, normally in my regular job of just general and honors English um, for ninth graders, I have to convince them to read and write and to enjoy it and to realize that it's not just a class, but it's a way of life. Um, and it takes me a while to like get people on board. So I'm just interested to see if this class will draw um, the people that are already doing that and I don't have to spend so much time trying to win them over. They will already be like, oh, the time of my day when I get to come in and talk about books. That's what I'm hoping. Anywho, Anthony Horowitz is the first one that I'm gonna highlight. So I need to read Stormbreaker because this is the one that I want to highlight with him. But I chose him because I know that he has um, a lot of good young adult series, but he also has adult series. So I've talked to you about Magpie Murder. I love this one. Um, and it is an adult mystery, you know, not like it's um, edgy adult. It's just more geared toward adult interests, whereas Stormbreaker 
is definitely an Alex Ryder YA mystery, so I need to read that. I also have Scorpio Rising, which is part of the Alex Ryder series, and then I do have The Sentences Death by him, which um, is part of the Magpie Murders. Um, I think it's part of the Magpie Murders series, but it's on my um, To Be Read. It says Exclusive Edition. So the Magpie Murders, if you'll remember, they did turn them into <coughs> a TV series. I can't remember if it's on Brit Box or Acorn or what it was on. Um, I feel like it's PBS. It's PBS, pretty sure. Uh, so I just need to read The Sentences Death. I would like to read everything by those authors while I'm teaching that class. Um, uh, Neil Gaiman is the other one that I chose, Coraline. I thought that would be a good seasonal read and a, a nice um, smaller one for them to read because I think it's about every four weeks we need to get through um, a book. So I've already read Coraline. It's an easy sell, good to talk about. He's another one that I want to talk about because he also had books for adults. I have not read Stardust, Neverwhere, or The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Um, so those are three on my um, short to be read list by him. And um, uh, the other one that we do a lot of Neil Gaiman is the Graveyard Book, um, but we did I didn't choose the Graveyard Book for our read. Um, just it's it's longer, but I often especially read excerpts from that with my regular classes because it is a beautifully written book. So there's that. Uh, the other ones I'm reading, Speak, Lori Halls Anderson. Um, it, I think it's just a good foray into young adult literature. And um, E. Lockhart, uh, what's it called? Um, One of Us is Lying. I think that'd be super good. So. Those are my four authors that I'm that I'm focusing on and just mentioning to you that I still am working on it. Since episode 39, I've been walking you through the books that I'm recommending in my classroom so you can kind of see what those are um, and making sure that I have reviews for you out on Goodreads. So I'm still working on that. I did not keep up with it all year. I worked on it, but it was difficult. So I still have a stack of books down here that I've already talked about in my classroom that I'm making sure that I'm mentioning to you and then shelving them there. So it's a process. I'm okay that it's a process. That takes me to the hall. So give me a minute to switch a room. All right, so we are in the book hall section, but before we do that, this doesn't fit into any section, so I'm gonna do it now. You're gonna find 400,000 YouTube videos that give you summer reading and they give you Ellen Hillerbrand and um, Colleen Hoover and, um, you know, Mer uh, Megan Miranda. And I agree with all of those. However, I love Moby Dick and I don't know how I haven't talked to you about this. I'm pretty sure I have talked to you about Moby Dick, the actual novel. Like that's what I think you should read for your summer reading. I love it. I love it so much. It was a book project that I did. I don't really know how it got started, but once again, I start these things uh, and then they just mean so much, but I, oh, I know how I got started. So it was this. So um, I met this person, Matt Kish at Cincinnati Books by the Banks, and he read Moby Dick and took each page and illustrated it. And he was doing that on a blog and some of his friends said, you know, I think there's a wider audience for this. You should make this public. And so he did, and then he got a book deal out of it. I bought the book and then I convinced some people to read the book with me um, while we went through this and it was phenomenal. It took us over a year um, and we would read, you know, a section and then get together and talk about it. And I absolutely loved it. Um, so Moby Dick in pictures, one drawing for every page, Matt Kish, highly recommend it. And I highly recommend Moby Dick for your summer reading. I'm not kidding. I know it sounds crazy. I did not expect to love the book as much as I love it. It's one of my favorite books. So I showed you the book that I read, The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren. I picked that up at a local coffee shop in Hamilton called The Fringe. Little free library somewhere. I'm not even sure where, but Katherine Coulter's Riptide. I think these came from the Lorelei one. I dropped a few off, picked a few up. Robin Carr, Promise Canyon, which is a Virgin River novel. I've never read those, but I do appreciate the um, series. So I picked those up and again, traded. I always have a bag of books in my trunk and take it with me whenever we're going on a trip. I take a couple of books on the little tote bag, um, just in case. I think I picked this one up in Colerain at a little free library. Um, it's Janet Ivanovich and it's Thanksgiving. Love seasonal, reason, love seasonal reading and also love Janet Ivanovich. So can't go wrong with that. 
uh, popped into the Loveland Goodwill, which is a really good Goodwill. They've revamped it over the last year or two, um, and they have a pretty good book section. I usually am able to find something there. Picked up a copy of The Clan of the Cave Bear, which I have read, so I'll look and see if I have a, um, a, a Goodreads review out there for that, and if I don't, I'll add it, but I love Clan of the Cave Bear. My uncle Crowley uh, is the one who told me to read it, and it's a big, long series, and I think I've only read the first one, but it was unlike anything that I had read up until that point, and so glad that he told me to read this book. Now, it also has a beautiful book jacket um, that is worth just having the book on my shelf for that. But I highly, highly recommend Clan of the Cave Bear. Um, it, and I will put a review out there for it if I don't have it. So I'll put that in a different section for you. Um, I picked up these Jenny Colgan's books. I picked these up. Christmas on the Island and Midnight at the Christmas Bookshop. Pretty sure I've talked to you about her before. Um, but I can't quite remember what, so I'll look and make sure. But both of these will go on my to-be-read list and their seasonal reading, Christmas and Christmas. Got a copy of Legend and Lattes, finally. I love this book. I listened to it a couple of years ago, um, but unfortunately, this is a paperback and it's $18. I cannot pay $18 for a paperback. I remember seeing it in the bookstore and I really wanted to buy it and I was just like, you cannot do that. So glad that I finally did find a copy um, Thrift, which is more like $1.99, uh, but this is a great book and I want it so that I can uh, loan it out and show people that terrific cover because that's a ridiculously great cover. It's by Travis Baldry and I will definitely read more in that series. I just haven't. I picked up a copy of this. I don't know it, but it's Amanda Don Johnson, The Library of Broken Worlds. So it's got the word library in it. How will I not take that home with me? Um, it looks good. I'm interested in it. And then I picked up another copy of Station Eleven. Um, I've not read this. This is one that I'm going to ask my book club if someone's read it and should we read it. Um, and I have a copy and then I have a copy for the classroom because I know that it's going to need a copy in the classroom. Um, so I was glad to get an extra one of those. That was the Loveland Goodwill. Now, I don't know why I can't seem to find this copy. Um, it's got to be right here somewhere. I'm just missing it. But I had already had a copy of this. It's Hanif Abdurraqib. They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us. It's a collection of essays. He was at the Columbus Book Festival. I knew he was going to be there. I had already purchased this um, a while back when I was in Columbus and I was in a bookstore and the book person talked it up to me. So I purchased it. I only read a couple of the essays so far, so I do need to get back to that. But at the um, St. Vincent de Paul in Loveland, which is my favorite thrift store to go into to look for books, and that's a long list, but I do love that one. Um, he had a copy of There's Always This Year on Basketball and Ascension, and I was showing it to my cousin, so it's gotta be around here somewhere, but I don't see it right this second. I don't know where it went to, um, but I picked up that because I knew that we were gonna be seeing him in Columbus. We didn't actually end up seeing him because he was a ticketed event. Um, but I, I'm sure he'll be there again later. So I'm happy that I got another copy of his books, but I don't know anything really, but even the essays that I read so far, I don't have enough to say. So we'll come back to that. I picked up another copy of Jurassic Park. Um, I have a copy here. I have a copy in my classroom. I will either put an additional copy in my classroom or just have it for a free little library exchange because I absolutely love it. Um, I had a copy of Sam, no. It looks like I picked this up. Yeah, I did have a copy of Samurai Shortstop Refuge, a uh, refugee in my classroom. So I picked up a copy um, for me so that I could read it. I've never read Alan Gratz. I had that. I have Refugee. Samurai Shortstop is that book. I had Refugee also. Um, so I picked up an extra copy of that. And um, I've not read him, but my students often call him by name. Like they've read him. So. Um, I need to read something by him. He was probably on my summer reading list. What I realized is I always have those books on my summer reading list that I know I need to get to during the school year. And then in the summer, I don't want to read school related things. <laughs> so then I just don't. Um, so during the school year, um, I am listening in that um, text that came through at the very beginning before I forgot to silence my phone. 
uh, was um, concerning this, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, this is a great book. I read it a long time ago. I always have a copy in my classroom and book talking in my classroom. Um, so I just have an extra copy because I have a copy, have one in my classroom. I just picked up an extra copy and I've been listening to this um, on YouTube. There's a free audio. Um, I don't know about copyright there, but it's free audio. So I've been listening to that with a former student and then we're just checking in every once in a while to talk about it. Really like it. I know a lot of my former students who've never read anything uh, once they graduate, they like to read about finance. So that's a really good one. Um, at, at first I was like, it's a little outdated, but I still think it's worth it. And then as I'm listening to it, there might be a little bit that is outdated, but it is still like definitely worth listening to, um, worth reading if you're interested in your finances at all. Like he just tells you what he has learned. Super, super good. Um, I picked up two of these because they were two copies and it looked like a book that I might want to share after I read it. Ona Irvinson's Rules for Commuting by Claire Pooley, a novel, looks super good. Um, and I don't know, I couldn't, it was $18, like saw the $18 sticker on it, and I was getting it for $1.99, I think it was. So I just couldn't pass it up. So that's on my to be read list. 52 lists for happiness. I have the, I'm looking because I thought, yeah, it is right here. I have the two, the 52 lists. I can't read it because it's a gold cover. 52 list something um, that I've had for a long time, but I don't have this 52 list for happiness, weekly journaling inspiration for positivity, balance, and joy by Marina Sill. Um, so I picked that one up because I know I like her list prompts. And then ta-da, finally been going to Crossroads for I don't even know how many years, but uh, Brian Tome, um, this one's called Move Devotional, a guide to get up and go forward. I've not read any of his books. Like we listen to him you know, if we attend Crossroads Eastside, um, so we're watching a video screen. I don't know that we've ever, we've gone to Oakley a couple of times. I don't know that we've ever heard him speak there, but he did crazy. Um, he came out and talked to Blanchester through our FFA program one year. Um, super good. He talked about the five marks of man. It was very good. At the time, I remember thinking he might not know his audience because he said a couple of things like um, related to hunting or something which makes no sense because I know he hunts I can't remember it was something weird um but it was good and then we ended up going to crossroads years after that and uh love it so this is the first one that I've had by him it's published by Zondervan uh, which is a big Christian publishing house so looking forward to reading that and picked it up at the St. Vincent de Paul in Milford um, speaking of Crossroads, somewhere, let me find it. There we go. Speaking of Crossroads, they mailed this to us, a free copy of Michael Iaconelli's Dangerous Wonder, The Adventure of Childlike Faith. They mailed this to us um, every once in a while. We're not members at Crossroads. I don't even know if they do members, but we, we do tithe on a um, routine basis, so I do think that makes them think you are a member. Um, so they do mail us things from time to time. We get called teammates. There you go. So not member, but teammates. Your continued generosity is pushing our church into new and fruitful ministry. One of the ways I want to acknowledge and appreciate your giving this year is sending you a copy of a book that's been meaningful to me. Dangerous Wonder was written by a giant in youth ministry who had a profound impact on me decades ago. Recently went through his book again and found his simple vision for having a life of wonder still refreshes my soul. Um, and so I do plan on reading that one. Uh, I'm always looking for a good devotional read. So again, in the comments, if that's something, if that's a genre that you read, I'm always looking for a good one. Currently I am reading, um, why is it completely, Anne Lamont's Traveling Mercies and um, Henry Nowen's Trappist Monk, Je ne sais, Diaries of a Trappist Monk, something like that. Those are the two that I'm currently reading as well as just you know, I take my old Bible and I take my new Bible and I transfer over the things that I have um, underlined and notations that I've made. And I just do that on a continuing basis. That's what I call my devotional time. Um, but I'm always looking for a good devotional read. And that one came in the mail. So throwing that one out there. Um, we went to a coffee shop, The Luminary, which was really good. It's actually, uh, it's called Luminary by Laterza. Laterza is a coffee brand, I think. Um, and it used to be, 
North College Hill Coffee Shop, I think. So it's just kind of changed names. Um, but we went there and they had a um, trade shelf and I dropped off a book and then picked this up, Madly Deeply, The Diaries of Alan Rickman. I think that's gonna be super interesting. Um, I know him from Harry Potter, but he also was in Robin Hood. That's the other one I remember. And it's just his little notations of the day. So I just think that it sounds like it would be an interesting um, book to have on the bedside and read a little here and there. Um, it starts his diaries in 1993. Uh, and again, when I say diaries, it's just like June 13th, quiet pleasure of preparing food for friends, 1 p.m., Michael C., Michael G., Christopher and Laura Hampton, Danny and Layla Webb, Jane and Mark and Raymond and Lily, the sun emerged and we spilled into the garden. June 20th, Patrick Caulfield, English painter who says he hates painting, but it's how he earns a living. The horror of walking into this small room important to do something, doesn't matter what, just something. And then they're just little tidbits. Um, and I've really enjoyed um, flipping through this and I do want to read like the whole thing. So uh, looks really good, picked it up, dropped something else off. I have two that I don't remember where I picked them up from. I don't know. But I have The Bookish Life of Nina Hill, which I'm pretty sure my sister has read and said I should read. And then Love in the Time of Serial Killers by Alicia Thompson. I don't know where I got it from, but I know I've heard of it before. So I picked that one up. Here's that book I was looking for. There's Always This Year on Basketball and Ascension by Hanif Abduraquib. There's that one. It says by the author of the National Book Finalist, The Little Devil in America. So throwing that one out there. I don't remember where the... Um, Love in the Time of Serial Killers and the Bookish Life of Nina Hill came from. I didn't mark that. Uh, White Oak Coffee, Little Free Library. I saw um, that they had, um, my sister I think showed me that they had put in a free little library in front of their coffee shop, White Oak. Um, and so I made sure to take a book when we went for coffee the next morning and picked this up. Huang Bo Ram, Welcome to the Wainam Dong Bookshop. Don't have any clue, but looks really good, so picked that one up. Here are the two books my, cousin's De my cousin Deb gave me, Agatha Christie, The Unexpected Guest, which I don't have a copy of, and then Dog Songs by Mary Oliver. Um, and Mary Oliver is someone I definitely have want I've wanted to read her, and I have not. I've read like little essays, but I need more. I need a complete work. So super happy to find that, or super happy she gave me that. Picked up a couple of books this weekend, but honestly, not many at all. And that's, you know, we go up there for the book festival. We know we're going to be thrifting. We assume we're going to be bookish um, shopping. Um, and we didn't shop that much. I don't know. We didn't have great luck. But I did pick up a copy of Carl Hyacinth's Scat, um, which I believe is young adult or even children's. It doesn't say. Bunny Starch, the most feared biology teacher ever, is missing. She disappeared after a school field trip to Black Vine Swamp. To be honest, the kids in her class are relieved. <laughs> Ooh, there's that one. Um, and then Sociopath. We were actually talking about this book. We stayed with my um, cousin Deb's um, childhood friend in Upper Arlington and had a great conversation. I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about, but sometimes you're just around people that make sense. Like they fit into your conversation. They fit into your world. You're interested in what they have to say. You want to know what they've watched, what they've read. You, you know, like it just works. Um, it happened at the same time that, um, Trump was shot at the Trump rally and, uh, it was just, we were able to have such a good conversation during that time. And we talked books and I mean, just so much fun, so much fun. And she had mentioned this book, Sociopath, a memoir by Patrick Ganji, PhD and, um, Patrice, Patrice. Now I'm like, Patrick, it was a girl, Patrice. Um, my cousin had recommended it to her, so then they talked about it, and then I'm like, oh, I need to read that book. And then we stopped at a Goodwill. On the way back, it was storming. We pulled off in Lebanon, and, and we went in there, and this was there, so I'm like, well, obviously I have to buy it. Um, but a fascinating, revel revelatory memoir recounting the author's struggle to come to terms with her own sociopath sociopathy and her drive to shed new light on the often maligned and misunderstood disorder. So really looking forward to reading that. I have another stack somewhere. All right, so then um, end of the weekend, went to uh, Joseph Beth, the uh, Bronte Bistro, which never disappoints. 
Um, her daughter Leona met us there and we had dinner and then we went our separate ways. She went with her daughter to spend the rest of the weekend um, before she flew back to Florida. And then I stopped at um, Half Price Books because I needed the next murder she wrote and I thought I had seen it there a while back. Margaritas and Murder, Jessica Fletcher and Donald Bain. 350 it was there, purchased it. Um, I am trying to get these on Libby Audio, but they don't always come that way. Um, so even if it's like an ebook, like I could do that too, but some of these just, they're not, they're not like that. So that's okay, that's fine. I'll buy it when I need to. So I picked up a copy of that and then they had a couple of Agathas. So 249 Agatha Christie, Mr. Parker Pine Detective. And I've got to look on these because I think this is one that's an alternate um, title uh, because it's got like the case of the middle-aged wife in it, the distressed lady, the discontented husband. So maybe not, maybe I have read all of these, but I feel like it, that's not the name of the book that we did, but it might be. Anywho, picked that one up for two fifty. dollars then they had this one for $4.99 and you can see they thought it was something special because they put it in a slip cover. Fine, you can do that. Um, but you know, like, I don't know what makes this one 95 cent from Dell and then this one 2.25. I guess this is just older. I don't know. They both have, what's that called? Flocking? No. There's a word for that. When you edge the color the end pages are a different color. I don't remember. Anywho, um, but this one I did pay $4.99 for, but it's Partners in Crime, and I did not have a copy of that one. And then I really thought about this one, but it's $4. The Spiritual Poems of Rumi. My students often ask for poetry, and I have a hard time finding it for them. Um, so I picked that one up, and then ta-da, found a Nick Petrie, and he was in the clearance section for $5. Um, the Wild One, a Peter Ash novel. So super excited now that I'm looking for him and he was there. And I did pick up one other Murder, She Wrote. Now they had a lot of Murder, She Wrote, so I didn't feel the need to like purchase them all right now. But this one was only $4 and it's a hardback, sorry, $3 and it's a hardback. Uh, Murder, She Wrote, Trouble at High Tide. So I love that they always put um, um, Jessica Fletcher's picture on there too. I think that's super fun. Uh, but I picked those up all at the half price on uh, Montgomery Road. All right, that takes us to some book news. So let me see what I have on here to make sure that I tell you about today. We have been filming for an hour and 48. That's not terrible. I thought it was going to be a lot more because my book stack was large. Um, but most of those, not most, some of those I had already talked to you about. I just wanted to make sure I kind of re-mentioned them before putting them out there. Um, Suzanne Collins has a new Hunger Games book coming out March 18th of 2025 called Sunrise on the Reaping. It's Panem, 24 years before the Hunger Games that we were introduced to. Um, it was the 50th Hunger Games. So I gotta check into that because it was going on 24 years prior and that was the 50th one. Okay. Um, also known as the second quarter quell. So I gotta look up a little bit on that. Emily Henry, um, her book, Happy Place, is being turned into a movie by Jennifer Lopez. <clears throat> her other books are also getting turned into movies, Beach Read, Book Lovers, People We Meet on Vacation. I've only read People We Meet on Vacation, but I have Book Lovers right here. I just need to read it. I think I borrowed Beach Read even. Um, I have not read Weaver's Butcher and Blackbird, but it's a very recognizable cover and that's getting turned into a movie. Uh, Fourth Wing, I've talked to you about that. That's getting turned into a series by Rebecca Yaros. That's getting turned into a series. Should be interesting, but I will definitely watch that. Good Girl's Guide to Murder, which I absolutely love and have recommended many times, turning into a series. Um, Colleen Hoover's Verity, turning into a movie. Aster's Light Lark is turning into a movie, recognizable one. Cole's A Thousand Boy Kisses. Hannah's The Nightingale. Um, v. V. C. Schwab, I think, or V. E. Schwab, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which I've tried reading and couldn't make it through. Need to return to it. Zevin's Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow is getting turned into a movie. Um, Holly Black's Cruel Prince. Rio, If We Were Villains. Why does it not like how I have villains written? Villains with an I, that's why. Um, so just throwing those out there. Now, I did talk to you about um, the Columbus Book Festival 
um, Abedrugeb, the two books that I have by him, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, and there's always this year on Basketball and Ascension. Um, but Alex e Erickson was there, so I kind of mentioned him, and I've talked to you about him with the Bookstore Cafe series, Death by Coffee, Death by Tea, Death by Pumpkin Spice, Death by Vanilla Latte, Death by Eggnog, De Death by Espresso, Death by Cafe Mocha, Death by French Roast, Death by Hot Apple Cider, um, Death by Hot Co Cocoa. He also has a book series that has to do with like the Maine Coon, like the cat, I think, but I haven't done that. Dial M for Maine Coon. It's the Forever Pets Mystery. So I have a copy of that, just need to read it. Um, Haddix was there. Um, can't think of her first name, but Among the Hidden, which I have not read, but I've read some of her others. Um, Victoria Roth, Veronica Roth was there with Divergent and Insurgent. I've read Divergent, need to read Insurgent. Kristen Simmons was there. It looks like I do have them right here. Why am I not showing them to you? I don't know. But Kristen Simmons, Article 5. Did I have to add? No, I have one out there for that. She was there, um, and I've talked to you about her book. Here's that Dial M for Maine Coon that looks good by Alex Erickson, but I need to read that. Um, and then these are the books that I have by him. Death by Pumpkin Spice, Death by French Roast, Death by Tea, and Death by Coffee. So I talked to you about those already. Uh, Carrie Winfrey was there. I have Very Sincerely Yours, Not Like the Movies. Both of those I need to read. I've read Waiting for Tom Hanks. I don't think these are a series. I think they just look alike, but I could be wrong. Um, but they're published by Berkeley, and I really like the Berkeley Publishing House. Don't know why. Um, and here's the Veronica Roth. I've read Divergent. I need to read Insurgent. So there's your Columbus Book Festival recap. Some um, authors that definitely need to be reading. Also, Jessica Strasser was there. I've read A Million Reasons Why. I'm reading, um, what am I reading? The Last Caretaker Now. It's a little slow going for me, but I'm reading it. And the next one that will be coming up is Books by the Banks, and that's Ellery Adams, um, something Arnett, why can't I think of her name, Duffy Brown, Send it China, L. Cosimano, Catherine Howe, Minnie McGinnis, Julie O'Neill, uh, again, Kristen Simmons, again, Jessica Strasser, again, Carrie Winfrey. So I have some time to be starting on that. Um, I like to read the authors that I know are going to be there in case I get a chance to talk to them. Um, who was it? Was it Minnie McGinnis that I started talking to? And I'm like, oh, my students really like you. I've read some of your books. And she said, which ones? And I was like, oh, let me see. I have read. And then I had to like pull that out there. So now I'm like, always, if I might have a conversation with an author, I'm going to review what I've read by them and I'm going to read their next stuff. Um, I did watch a movie that I wanted to talk to you about called Wicked Little Letters. FYI, the most language I've ever heard in a movie in my entire life. However, it was very Agatha-ish um, because of the Wicked Little Letters that we had just read. I can't remember which Agatha book that we just read that had the um, poison pen letters. So it felt very much like that. It's a super good movie. Watched it on the plane. Um, we flew Delta. I'm usually an Allegiant girl because I can get round trip tickets for like under $100 or $200. Uh, but we flew Delta for Hawaii because we were um, getting some kickbacks with um, his aunt who has some connections with Delta. We got a companion pass that was a lot cheaper than a regular flight. Um, and then she just maneuvered the other flights. It worked out. Um, and Del flying Delta was an experience. <laughs> like, uh, you know, they give you drinks and snacks and blankets and free Wi-Fi and free movies. It was ridiculous. Um, but it was nice. I enjoyed it. It was our 30th wedding anniversary. Um, and it was worth it. It was worth all of it. Uh, but I did get to watch Wicked Little Letters and I highly recommend it. Just know most language I've ever heard in a movie, which is really the whole premise of the movie, but whatever. Um, I don't know where it's at, but, uh, oh, I see it. Hold on. So when I was going to talk to you about the, um, Robert Mishner, James Mishner, James Mishner, Hawaii book. Um, I was cleaning up my documents and my notes and I just had Hawaii in there and this one popped up. I didn't realize I owned it. 
It's Monk, Mr. Monk Goes to Hawaii, a novel by Lee Goldberg. And so I missed it. I didn't get to read this one before we got to Hawaii, but I will be reading that on my short list for sure. That being said, I am happy to be your friendly librarian. Uh, if you know my backstory, I was a high school librarian for 20 years. Would love to have finished out my career in there. That wasn't in the cards. They shut down our library in our high school um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, and then things have just continued that way. Uh, so now I teach high school English, <clears throat> and I do really, really enjoy it, but I would go back to the library like that. Would love to get back into that. Uh, but I'm glad that I have this outlet to be able to talk about books with you, and it doesn't have to be young adult. I can talk to you about any of the books because I'm not getting paid for this. I am not under contract. Um, so all of the books that I review on YouTube, you can get for free from your public library. You do not need to purchase all these. I obviously purchase a lot, but almost all of my books, I get free little library exchanges, thrift, half price books, um, exchange with friends. I don't pay retail very often, like in all of the book haul that I did for you today, none of those were retail because I can't pay $18 for a paperback book and have the collection that I do. So you can get them for free at your public library, but if you do choose to purchase them, please support your local independent bookstore. But no judgment, we order from Amazon and pick up at Target as much as anyone else. So there is that. I do love a little meme that came across my feed this morning um, when I was getting ready, and that was, you know, with the Amazon Prime deals, the Columbus Public Library is going to do a deal um, during Amazon Prime days that they will loan you any book for free. Is that not lovely? That's hilarious. <clears throat> uh, if you need to, you can go to your public library's website and probably get your library card from there, and then you can also just get ebooks and audiobooks without ever having to get to your public library, but I encourage you to go to your public library. Um, if you don't have a card, they will walk you through that process. I use Libby religiously. <clears throat> Let's be social. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Pinterest, TikTok. I'm on all of the socials um, under my name. <clears throat> Hoping that doesn't come to bite me in the butt at some point, but DeShannon Lovin, your friendly librarian is here for you. Um, and I share lots of bookish content. Hit the subscribe and like button so that I know that you're enjoying these ridiculously long videos. Comment, email, message me. Let me know what you're reading, what you're looking to read. If you have suggestions and comments, I'm always happy to hear them. Keep in touch, folks, and happy reading. Enjoy.